The way that a mass spectrometer works is usually broken down in kind of into three or four steps, okay, depending on the level you're going into. So here in a simple step, we want to look at three things. The very first thing you do is you put your sample into a mass spectrometer and somehow you add charge to it. You have to ionize your sample. Uh, and there are different ways that can happen. You can send a beam of electrons through it, you can use acid base chemistry, but you have to charge your samples. Then, in the second phase, you separate the samples based on that mass to charge ratio. So, there are different ways to do each of these. Uh, this is a time of flight. So, in that, you have a, a whole crew of charged par particles, ions. Then you, you accelerate them rapidly down the, down the chamber. And the ones with more mass will accelerate less. And so, they will take a longer time period. And so, this just times, runs a timer between pulses and detects how long it takes for different things to travel down and then reads out what those are. The last thing you need to be able to do is you need to be able to detect whatever is slamming into your detector. So somehow your current needs to be measured of how many charged particles are hitting a given piece and you can see that in the relative sizes of the particular piece in a mass spectrometer. Now for most people that are beginning to do mass spectrometry you're not actually going to need to go through and know the logistics of how all these work. There are a lot of different manipulations you can do, a lot of different schemes that you can run in a mass spectrometer for each of those three components. Okay, So we're going to look more into like what, what we're getting out on the spectrum, but one of the really important points is that we're looking at a mass to charge ratio here. So the more charge you have, the stronger the force of interaction between whatever you're using to accelerate these particles, but also the larger the mass, the, the less acceleration you'll see. Now, for simplicity purposes, usually we start through and we go where we always assume the fragments are a plus one charge. And that's because in acid-base chemistry that'll be true, and additionally, for a lot of these simple electronic uh, ionization mechanisms, that will be true. But there are exceptions to that, especially when we get into larger molecules. Okay, but what you're really highlighting in, when doing this when you're starting out is being able to look at a chemical formula being able to look at its mass spectra and be able to obtain information about what happened. So this is a mass spectra for pentane, which is C5H12, which is straight chained alkane. So we have CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. And here is our mass spectra. So one of the important things you can see from a mass spectra is, is hopefully you can see a peak at the molar mass. So this is 60 and 12, that's 72 grams per mole, and here we see a 72 peak. So this is the peak of the entire molecule when it obtains a plus one charge. Okay. Then we can go through and kind of analyze and say, well, what are these other peaks? What's this 29, the 43, and the 57? So if we go ahead and look at splitting this molecule into two fragments, if we, if we break this apart at the carbon-carbon bond there, then we end up with the C2H, 5, and that's 29 mass units. And here we have C3H7, so there we're looking at a 43. Well, lo and behold, here's a peak at 29, and here's a big giant peak at 43. So we can see that this 43 peak in particular is occurring quite frequently. There's also one at 57, and that will actually occur if you add this CH2 group to the 43 peak. Okay. So mass spectroscopy is, is very good for confirming your sample by kind of going through and saying, okay, well, what would make sense of, from this formula, and then looking for those particular things. There are also some common things that you can look for. Right? So, um, so if you have an alcohol or, or a hydroxyl group, then, then maybe you'll see a peak at 17. Uh, if you have a lot of methyl groups, you might see a peak at 15. And one of the things that's really nice to look for are things like chlorine and bromine because these have an isotopic abundance that actually is very clear from mass spectra. Chlorine has two isotopes, isotope 35 and 37, and the 35 occur, occurs about 75% of the time. So with chlorine, you would expect to see at 35 a peak, and at 37 a peak that's a third as big. Okay. For bromine, you have two isotopes, 79 and 81. And they occur about 50-50. The 79 is slightly more common. So you would expect to see those two peaks. So one of the nice things with this is you can quickly rule out whether you have one of those two halogens present in your molecule. Here I have nothing at 79 or 81. I have nothing at 35 and 37. And the peaks that I have that are above those two points, 
don't show me this particular relationship. The size of this peak compared to this is not indicating anything that's showing me that I have a chlorine attached to something. Okay. Now, in this one, we are looking at pentanthrione, so CH3, CH2, carbonyl, CH2, CH3. And again, if we kind of started to sit there and say, well, what do we expect from this? We would expect a cleaving point to be here or on the other side of that carbonyl. Um, and we would also expect to see the, the total molar mass. Total molar mass of this, we have C5H10O. So we have 60, 70, 86. And there's our molar mass peak. And then for our two peaks here, we have the CH3, CH2, that's C2H5, that's 29 for the mass of that. And for the other one, we have C3, that's 36, plus 5 is 41, plus 16 is 57. Okay, so this one is actually really, really good in agreement with what we would expect to see from this. Okay. So when you're going through and doing mass spectra, there's not a ton you want to use for, you don't, you're not probably going to identify your, your, your chemical from this alone. But the good information you can get are, what's the molar mass, hopefully. Is there a chlorine or bromine? You might be able to see if there's an OH group or a methyl group in particular. Uh, but then at that point, what you want to do is more at the end when you think you know what you have, you want to look and say, okay, well, how would this split apart? And what would the masses of those fragments be? And then look to confirm that you've chosen the correct formula from that. Okay, so some stuff you can do at the very beginning, but also it's very good at the end to be able to go through and confirm what you have or what you don't.